in the Western. So here we go. Okay. So today we will hear three presentations about online lesson planning and get to learn from their successes and perhaps more importantly, the like not quite successes yet. Um, first up, we'll hear Colleen Barrett from the University of Kentucky, followed by Maureen Mariansky from Indiana University. Um, they'll both be presenting about online synchronous classes. Finally, Katie Kessington and Rachel Ingold from Duke will be presenting together about how they prepared online asynchronous learning modules. Um, feel free to use the chat to ask questions at any time. Our moderators will keep track of them um, as we go. And then following all three presentations, we'll have time for a live Q&A discussion. All right, so with that, Colleen, feel free to take it away. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. Um, you can do the awkward moment while I start my PowerPoint. Okay. Um, so before I get a little bit too far into the weeds with this specific lesson plan, I thought it might be helpful to kind of establish a bit of a background about me. So I'm the rare books librarian for the Special Collections Research Center at the University of Kentucky. And my job consists of a little bit of everything, um, which also includes planning and facilitating rare book active learning exercises with my wonderful colleagues in the education department. So my, cult my workplace culture uh, really promotes active learning exercises whenever possible over like show and tells. And we would rather have students work through a worksheet and be able to actively handle the materials than listen to a lecture. Um, so while my colleagues are doing like 80 classes a semester, I'm more in the like five to 10 range on like a good semester. And I think collectively this part of my like rare book cheerleading is about like 20% of my job. So other good things to know, I've only been here since 2019. I don't come from a traditional instruction librarian background, uh, but really I'm come more from a book selling one where I more regularly interacted with audiences at all levels of understanding. So though I have an MLS and worked in a public services special collections department as a student, I've often felt kind of insecure about my status as an official educator, uh, probably because people do a really good job talking about their successes and not necessarily their failures. But I'm here today to tell you all about the things that went sideways with my first attempt at an online rare books active learning exercise and kind of like what we can all learn from it instead. So I first began working with Dr. Regina Hamilton and her introduction to African American studies course last, course last fall. Uh, when we first developed an activity I kind of like to call rare books speed dating. So in this in-person scenario, her students come to the Special Collections Research Center where they spend five to six minutes at a table with two or three books related to things they've read before moving on to the next one. They have a worksheet asking them basic questions about the format and physical features of the text and kind of how that format can impact the understanding and reading of it. Dr. Hamilton and I would walk from table to table, her often answering subject specific questions as I answered questions about printing history, bindings, and things like the long S. Uh, making sure that the books were handled with care and not fear. So in a 75 minute class, these students usually saw 18 or 20 books. And this was like really successful for two semesters. So when we both realized that it would be impossible for in-person instruction to take place this semester, we decided to try making an online synchronous version of the activity using different digital versions of books held in subscriptions from the library system, as well as a DIY doc cam to look at the physical versions of them held in the Special Collections Research Center. So before I go too much further, I'd like to take a moment and thank Kelly Hansen at the University of Missouri, uh, who publicly shared her online medieval manuscript identification activity that I ended up using as a template for my lesson plan. It really helped me think about organizing organization and how to approach planning. So anyway, following the principle of it being a good idea to break up the activity into separate chunks so that people aren't just staring at a screen for an hour and 15 minutes, we planned for the classes to happen in a series of separate 
parts like with each thing building on the next so that it could go from one to one section to another. So first I'd give a short introduction to special collections. So how one can go about researching things, what sorts of things are in the building, what kind of theoretical frameworks we traditionally use to understand them. I would explain the concept of paratext and provenance so they would know what sorts of things they're looking for with these digital versions of the books. Um, and other than being on camera, this pretty much mirrored the way we usually start a class in person. So second, we would break the class into breakout rooms of small groups, much like we asked people to sit at different tables. Uh, then each group would work together to fill out a Google Doc worksheet on three different editions of digitized rare books that asked them similar questions to those on the in-person worksheet, such as who made it, who owned it, that kind of thing. Uh, I selected two editions of Phyllis Wheatley Peters poems and the first American edition of, of Equiano's narrative, since those are items held in special collections. And we could later compare the digital surrogates to like a video screen share of the physical copy. I also made sure to offer different digital versions when possible in the hopes that students could find textual difference and form opinions on the usefulness of different digital platforms. So much like with the tables, Dr. Hamilton and I would bounce from group to group to answer any questions as they came up so that no one got too confused or overwhelmed. Third, we would all reconvene in a larger group to look at the UK copies of each edition they examined through a DIY webcam setup in my office. And that way they could see how their university's copies varied from the digital ones and hopefully gain a greater appreciation of item specific details with rare books and why each rare book is not created equal. We would then finish the class by collectively discussing our overall impression of the event and how reading a text one way may feel completely different from another. It was gonna be great. So looking back, this was definitely a lot to ask students who are still getting used to an online learning environment in the middle of a pandemic and hadn't equally been introduced to primary source research in the past. So when we were in a group, everyone seemed to understand the plan and understand the first step. But then once we broke into breakout rooms, all of the things that I didn't prepare for or know to prepare for started happening. So of course, there were technical problems. Some people ended up getting thrown out of their breakout rooms back into the main session, and then they couldn't figure out how to get back to their breakout rooms. And since Dr. Hamilton and I were not there, they were kind of stuck in limbo. Another technical problem that I didn't see coming, but I totally should have, was that some students didn't know how to log into their library account to access the digitized books that the university pays for. Because we were asking them to do this in small groups, they didn't have a good way to ask for help. Second, there was a lot of confusion about how to approach some of the questions on the worksheet. And I'm still kind of working my way through this and trying to figure out how to explain what went wrong. So like in a physical environment, it's really easy to say that this worksheet is meant more to be a note-taking assistant than something to be thoroughly completed. But I don't think that completely got communicated um, when we were doing it online. So some of the students wanted a really definitive answer to finding past owners or which institution um, currently holds the physical version of the digitized item. And I really meant those questions as more of a way to get them to like click through the book and kind of see how things made in that time period were formatted than necessarily finding something and checking a note off the box. Uh, so explaining to them that like the journey was more important than finding a specific right answer wasn't really what some of them were looking for. Well, once Dr. Hamilton ended up getting thrown off of Zoom, we ended up circling the wagons back into a large group and the class became more of like a traditional discussion of the weekly readings and not the exciting and hip rare book active learning exercise I was going for. We never got to the dot cam conversation at all. So I ended up taking pictures of things that made copies pictures of things that made the copies at the University of Kentucky unique and tweeting them to the class in a series of threads instead of being able to do it in person. So lessons. As a relatively new educator who's passionate about things like descriptive bibliography and provenance research, I think it's almost always safe to assume that I'm trying to fit too much into too little time. 
So this wasn't necessarily a lesson specific to this example, but it really never hurts to remember that, um, especially in an online environment. If we do this as a synchronous activity again, it would probably benefit us to have someone who's just dedicated to helping people out in the breakout rooms. Uh, I could also see the breakout group activity working well as an asynchronous activity, followed by a general class discussion, and maybe the dot cam as like the active in-person thing. Uh, it might also be good to have everyone practice opening library materials as a group so we could troubleshoot that ahead of time. I don't know how to fix the urge to know that there's a right or wrong answer to everything. So I'm probably just going to take that as a thing to think about more deeply moving forward and try and talk about it more as a larger group. Finally, I think it's always a good lesson to know that there's usually a way back from a complication, even if it's just sending things out into the world in a different way. I hope that some of my lessons learned will help you moving forward. And thank you so much for listening. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Colleen. I, I love it that we're sharing like not successes. I don't want to say failures, but wonderful. Um, so next up, Maureen, go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Maureen Mariansky. I'm the Education and Outreach Librarian at the Lilly Library at Indiana University, Bloomington. There's a lot to say. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen as well. Um, it's always, as Colleen was saying, kind of that moment of truth. Okay. How's it looking? You good? Thanks. Um, so some of the uh, lessons learned uh, and things that Colleen just talked about are going to be uh, familiar uh, <laughs> in what, what I end up talking about. Um, so I have kind of titled my short talk as uh, Plan Less, Engage More. So kind of similar to uh, Colleen's lessons. Um, my position uh, at the Lilly, I, I coordinate all of the, the teaching, all of the um, scheduling of classes and all of that coordinate all that fun stuff which uh is about well again in the before times about 250 um class sessions every year so quite a lot it's it's really the core uh, of my responsibilities i also am involved in in pretty much every other kind of public service function as well but it is kind of the core of what i do um so the class that I'm going to talk to you about is, is uh, interesting for a variety of reasons. Um, first of all, it was technically before the fall semester started. Um, in the two weeks before the fall semester starts, um, IU has intensive freshman seminars. So it's all freshmen incoming um, students um, who are um, who are new to college, new to IU, uh, new to the Lilly, which of course then that means um, that they are uh, in this particular year because of the pandemic, they're experiencing everything first for the first time in the virtual realm. So I was very um, conscious of that and aware um, that those that was the audience that I would be talking to and, and, and designing a class around. Um, the specific class that um, I worked with, it was, um, early August is called Blood Babies and Chainsaws. And it is a, a brilliant class by Professor Jennifer Ma Maurer um, on gender reproduction and horror film. So this is a class that um, my colleague, Rebecca Bauman has taught several times in person, um, probably for the past seven, eight years, something like that. Um, so she really had kind of a set way in which she um, kind of designed this class. And so it was a new class for me completely in terms of uh, the materials and um, coordinating and working with the professor, but also uh, a new environment, uh, which was kind of nice too, because I didn't really have any preconceived notions. I didn't, I didn't have a lesson plan of my own that I was kind of working from. So I felt a little bit of freedom in order to do this. Um, of course, we have the challenges of the pandemic, but there's also for us the challenge of our ongoing renovation. So our building pictured here um, is uh, clo it closed last December. So we're currently, um, our collections, we had to move everything out. So the collections are in other temporary locations. The staff is in temporary locations. Um, and part of what all of this meant as well 
is that uh, certain parts of the collection are inaccessible, uh, specifically our vault materials, which um, because we, this class session, usually the materials span the 16th to the 20th centuries, um, that means that uh, some of the earlier materials um, were not available. So it was this interesting thing that all these parameters that were kind of put in place I, I like those kinds of challenges because I think that's the moment where you can have the creativity can come through and you can and you can have really fun creative solutions uh, to what you're doing. Uh, the two things that I were most important to me is that I wanted to try and make sure that I was giving them a, an introduction to the Lilly Library and what it is. And usually I'm doing that and they're in the building and it's this kind of immersive uh, experience for students. Um, but I wanted to give them a good introduction of, of what the lily is, what it can offer, what kind of resources are available to them, but also how do I translate materiality through the, the virtual realm and as well as have some kind of active learning component. So those were the kind of the things I was thinking about going into all of this. So this was my plan. Um, I had an hour, we were scheduled for an hour long session. Um, I wanted to do a synchronous introduction to the Lily with a PowerPoint. Um, I'd been working on one uh, and it uh, had worked really well over the summer for a couple of sessions that I'd done. I'd also decided because of materiality, I wanted to show um, a couple, just a couple items with a show and tell. This was also, I should also say this is the first full synchronous session I did. It's the first session I used a document camera for and it's the first session I did a breakout rooms for. So there are a lot of firsts going on here. So uh, as you can see in the picture here, um, I had a couple like miniature books that I wanted to show with the document camera because I wanted uh, to give them a sense of scale and size. Um, and then I had uh, an anatomical model that had like the flaps um, that you could kind of manipulate. So I wanted to, those were things I was very particular about that I wanted to show. Um, we also were very lucky that some of the materials that are usually talked about in this class session um, have been digitized through Adam Matthew, uh, specifically in the London Low Life uh, database. So this is a, a, a brothel guidebook, the Swells Guide from London, um, which was one of the other items uh, that I showed them. So I wanted to also show them what was possible that they, they had access to digitized versions of these materials as well. I also designed an active learning uh, Padlet exercise, which is where the breakout rooms came in. Um, and there should be, um, <laughs> this is where we can uh, put the link for the Padlet um, into the chat. And I'm actually gonna switch over to it real fast, just to give you guys a sense. Um, so we digitized um, just six um, items and it was, uh, I have a short description of what the activity was up above in the expanded post for each of these. When you scroll down, I gave them the full citation. So there's no surprises, there's no guesswork. I didn't want them to think, you know, it's a quiz, it's a test, it's anything like that. Um, and give them a chance to really explore each of these um, images and they were to um, comment on these photos with uh, at least one observation and one question. So just to, uh, just a thought experiment to get them interested and engaged and starting to question and think about what they're looking at. Um, back to the PowerPoint. Um, and then the idea was that I would bring them back together into a group and we would, we would talk about that. So, and as you can see, I had these very specific timings um, and it looks great, right? Um, but what did I forget? <laughs> You know, what did I forget that ended up happening? What I forgot was actually student engagement and student curiosity. So everything was going swimmingly until I got to this slide uh, at the very end of my PowerPoint. There was just like questions, because I always do that. You always do that, like, oh, it's the introduction. And does anyone have questions now? This basically opened the floodgates and they had such brilliant questions they were asking about being a librarian, they were asking about the collections, they were asking about specific items that I put images on, uh, of on um, the PowerPoint, they were asking questions about the building, they were asking about the renovation, they were, they were just so engaged and so interactive with me, and especially over the chat, and that was something I hadn't really figured into all of this, is that the students I think they, because they didn't have to necessarily uh, say it out loud and say it and vocalize their question, uh, 
they felt like they could really um, ask even more questions. So we, the conversation kind of took on a life of its own and we had this, these brilliant kind of twists and turns and talking about it. Um, we were able, I, I did the show and tell as well. And um, it was the same thing. We had brilliant conversation and we, again, we were kind of going back and forth, um, but we got to the hour mark and we hadn't gotten to the active learning portion of this. Um, the other part of this that um, kind of chimed in, so this all has to do with timing and how much time I kind of assigned to each of the things. Um, one of the big things I didn't take into consideration that Colleen was talking about was the technology. And for me, the transitions between things, um, I didn't factor in how much time it would take me to share my screen, stop sharing my screen, make sure the document camera was um, hooked up properly, um, moving between the items, just the, the act of moving between the different items using the document camera because they were different sizes and shapes. That was a different timing issue that I hadn't factored in for. Um, and then, so we got to the hour mark, we hadn't gotten to the exercise. Um, luckily, the instructor was, we had a lot of flexibility for both of us. So we just were like, let's just keep going. So the session ended up being 30 minutes over what we had originally planned. And it ended up being incredibly successful. But again, the timing and how much, I mean, 30 minutes over isn't the, the best thing to have happen, right? Um, and then of course, because this is my first time with breakout rooms, it was the first time the instructor had ever used breakout rooms. Again, it was a timing issue uh, and a new technology issue of just not, not knowing the logistics and how it was gonna kind of run and how much time it was going to take. So I really look at it as a, an incredibly, ooh, an incredibly successful um, class, but just like um, Colleen, there were a lot of lessons learned. Um, so going back to what I titled this, plan less, engage more, budgeting time for questions, um, budgeting time for the students to express their observations and um, to talk with each other and, and not just with me as well, um, and just the logistics of, of the technology. Um, and one of the biggest things was kind of having the flexibility and making sure flexibility is part of all of this. Um, and I'm incredibly grateful because there was a big spirit of kind of, let's just try, let's just try and see what happens and experimentation um, that I had, not just with this session, but also with um, all of the sessions that I've been able to do this semester so far. Um, so yeah, that's what I have for everyone. Thank you so much, Maureen. I love it. Um, wonderful. All right, let's segue right into our last presentation um, with to Rachel and Katie. Um, so take it away, you two, and we'll have time to discuss. Good afternoon. Thank you so much uh, to the organizers for having us, and thank you to Colleen and Maureen for sharing their teaching experiences. Those are just wonderful. Um, I'm going to change tack briefly to share what we're doing at Duke and a couple of the things that we've put in place to make this new world successful for us before my colleague Rachel shares her experience teaching. Over the summer, our instructors began compiling a set of tips and tricks for teaching remotely. This evolved into a remote teaching best practices document that we shared with Duke Library staff and with um, our interns and fellows who are teaching with special collections materials this fall and spring. As we prepared for fall and now for spring, um, instructors are focused on creating one or two activities and modules using courses they regularly teach. This was inspired in part by UNC Chapel Hill's instruction offerings. As you'll see, um, if you browse our website, each module has an instructor summary for the person teaching, as well as a libguide that's geared towards students. In building the modules, we focused on a couple of key principles. First, that the content is accessible meaning that the students with limited or unstable internet access have something they can download and look at in advance of a class session if needed. Second, that the module can be used by anyone at Duke or elsewhere that wants to teach with primary sources. Each has a Creative Commons attribution, and we hope that these will be useful to faculty and librarians to supplement their own instruction, especially those with less capacity at their institutions. 
Third, uh, that consistent templates have clear learning outcomes and research skill building to make it easy for instructors to browse and find something that fits their goals. And that there's visual and language consistency for the students who may be in multiple sessions with us. And fourth, that the content can be delivered asynchronously or synchronously with or without a Rubenstein Library instructor. And finally, that anything we did would be evergreen, um, a new fun word at Duke that we're using a lot, and have a lifespan beyond the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, we, like many of you all, had reached capacity with our instruction program. So these teaching modules will serve as a longer term way to redirect special collections instruction when we inevitably hit capacity again. Um, I draw your attention specifically to the yellow fever in the 18th century module that was created by my colleague, Brooke Guthrie. This is an exemplary module um, for asynchronous teaching. In addition, we have a module template that we're using and others, um, everyone on this call is welcome to adapt if it's useful to their teaching. And in the future, I'm hoping that we'll extend the opportunity to build teaching modules to faculty and graduate students who teach regularly with Rubenstein material. I would also be interested in hearing from any of you offline if you are also offering online modules. Um, please do feel free to use and adapt our modules as you wish. And with that, I will turn it over to my wonderful colleague, Rachel Gold. Thank you, Katie. Can everyone hear me okay? Thumbs up, okay, great. So I'll be speaking about a specific module that I've worked on, how to create your own cabinet of curiosity. And I'll talk a little bit more about the class that utilized this activity. But I first wanna give a huge thanks and shout out to Katie Henningsen for being such a great leader and so supportive of all of our instruction endeavors, but especially this fall. So let me start by getting, giving a little bit of context about the class that utilized this activity. For the past few years, I've worked with a class called Artists, Engineers, Physicians, and Scientists in the Renaissance. Um, this is a class for first year students at Duke, an undergraduate course that's capped at 18 students. This class has also been actively um, involved in our, the Rubenstein Library's Archives Alive program. This is a program that integrates primary source materials into weekly course instruction. So the col our colleague who spearheads Archives Alive and I together would weekly bring um, early modern printed books to, to share with students. Obviously that would not work this semester. So I really wanted to think about some ways in which um, materiality could be conveyed to the students and, and what, uh, how that might work best. In thinking about this, uh, our colleague Kelly Wooten uh, created a teaching materiality online live guides, live guide. Some of you may have seen that. That was a great place for me to begin brainstorming some, some ways to think about this. Coupled with that um, is an interest that I have in cabinets of curiosities and how this class spends a few weeks really um, honing in on looking at a number of printed books that we have that show really vivid illustrations of natural history of cabinets of curiosities, these precursors to modern museums. Um, which give us a chance to talk a lot about a lot of different things. How, how are items acquired? What is collected? How is it described? Issues of colonialism and exploration, um, along with so many other aspects, classification and taxonomy. So I came up with this specific exercise and I shared it with the faculty member who is really receptive to new ideas and, and trying to make connections with students. Um, I created the activity instructions very much based on our document analysis worksheet. So uh, Colleen touched on this a little bit, asking questions like, what is the item? Um, what is its purpose? What questions does it have for you? But I decided to ask students to choose an item from nature, something that they could find in their dorm room or outside their apartment, something that was meant to be easily accessible and not stress them out, and then answer these questions. 
The activity was shared with the students a week before I met with them. And um, I also asked that they take a photo of the item that they chose so that we could do a really quick in-class, um, hopefully fun to them assignment based on that. Um, I had maybe 45, 50 minutes to go over this particular activity in the session. And um, when we did that, students were divided into breakout groups in Zoom, really hoping to um, get them to, to follow think, pair, share, to feel more comfortable in a smaller group, sharing with their peers what they found and what they wanted to talk about, but with the intent that when they came back together as a larger group, some of them would volunteer. And the, the class was maybe 15, 16 students. So they did have that comfort level and there were students who shared. Um, what I took away from what they shared, the, and not everyone, I'll come to timing, not everyone had a chance to share um, what they found and what they, uh, what they answered. But what really came through was the sense of memory and nostalgia that students felt um, there was a lot of this particular item reminded me of a family vacation or it reminded me of being with my family or friends. Um, some students talked wistfully about childhood and how now that they were 18, things were quite different. And it was just really obvious in this really short session that the past seven months have um, really taken an impact on, on everyone. Um, in terms of using the photos that they took, I learned about Padlet from this wonderful group, TPS, and I really wanted to get to get more comfortable with it. So I asked students to upload their photos to Padlet and to feel free to caption them and caption those photos in any way they would like. I also asked students to upload photos to Google Jamboard um, with a really quick exercise of getting feedback from them about what they liked best. I went over Padlet really quickly as I'm still learning a lot about it, but I told them that the idea was that they could move items around and classify them as they thought they might fit together. I don't think that, that they really have necessarily done that, but they overwhelmingly preferred Padlet to Google's Jamboard. They really like being able to caption um, these photos. Really quickly, the takeaways, very similar to Colleen and Maureen, I ran out of time. We didn't get every student to share. Um, there's some things that I would do different, differently for sure in the future. Um, technology was also an issue. I had everything um, on Google, Google Slides, Jamboard, and my Gmail crashed right as I was talking. So I had to leave the Zoom meeting and reboot my computer. Um, but I, I think technology and timing, I will totally echo that. Let me quickly end by saying, while this exercise, um, I use this exercise with an undergraduate course, I think it could be modified for a K-12 audience. A colleague of ours, Kelly Wooten, tested out the activity with an eight-year-old family member of hers. And um, here's the result of that. Um, I would be really eager to hear from others um, if you have ideas or, or suggestions about how I, I could change or enhance this. So, thanks so much. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Great. Well, we have a good solid 20 minutes left for questions and discussion. So um, I know that our chat moderators have been kind of combing through the chat. So why don't we get started with some of those? Sure. Um, the first question I have will be for Colleen, and it's uh, kind of a series of questions about your use of Twitter. Um, and they asked, why Twitter? And have you had success connecting with students that way? And if that was um, something that your university has been using for outreach and whether the engagement has been good on Twitter? Well, the reason I use Twitter is that um, well, I mean, I like Twitter in general. Twitter has been really helpful with connecting with like RBMS members and audiences. But um, Dr. Hamilton is like more of a Twitter presence than I am. And so because she was teaching, she's only doing one session in person, 
in person, like one session synchronous and then one session's asynchronous. And instead of assigning more reading, she's having her students find things that relate to the readings on the internet and then tweet them. And so instead of doing um, like Canvas participation things, it's all through tweets. So all I had to do was at the class Twitter account and use their hashtag. And that way, like everybody could see it together. Um, I don't think I've had a lot of like student engagement other than a couple of those students following me from that class, but I have gotten a good series of reference questions from Twitter just by like being there. <laughs> That's really great. And I love that example of using Twitter for class engagement across the board, which I personally hadn't experienced until my LIS degree. Um, our following question is for Maureen. Um, so and it, uh, it says, even with this being a threefold uh, new experience for you, which I personally applaud, um, have you found engagement with, I don't know, being cut off. Have you found engagement with collections after the session to be similar to how it was when classes were taught in person? Have you found, how have you been measuring outcomes of classes? That's a really good question. And also, thank you. Yeah, it was, it was as I was like prepping for this, I was like, wow, this was a lot to kind of take on in one pulse. I also just realized um, I, um, it took over doing the class a little short notice as well. You know, just add one more thing in. It's it's all good. Um, it was it was fun. Um, that's a great question though about um, engagement after the fact, which I think is a little bit more difficult for me to measure right now, just because um, our reading room isn't open. Um, everything's kind of going. Uh, all of our reference is remote, and we have. Um, uh, we do some consultations with document cameras uh, for, for people to engage with our materials, um, but a lot of our reference is going straight into digitization. Um, and a lot of what I was doing as well was trying to, like showing them the London Low Life database as, as, as a source that they could use. So in terms of if they ended up using that, I don't necessarily know. Um, I did get a really lovely um, email from one of the students as a follow-up, um, which was I was ecstatic about. It was a really sweet email. Um, so that that that's one of the ways I've kind of been measuring the outcome. Um, and the the instructor was also she kind of emailed me after the fact and was telling me about how the enthusiasm of the discussion kind of continued on because the, these course these um, intensive uh, freshman sem seminars are often like all day kind of events uh, for these two weeks before the semester officially starts. So there's a lot of interaction between the professor and the students. Um, so she kind of let me know that. Um, if y'all don't mind, I am going to share my screen again, though, because one of the things um, I went back and looked at the email that the student gave me. And one of the things I did not mention before is something I've added to my introduction, which is, I think, one of the things that led to such a like kind of um, involved and kind of detailed discussion. So let me try this again. Um, all right, sharing my screen. Okay, so this is the slide that I have I have started. And when I did this class, it was the first time that I had done this with an undergraduate class. I did, I kind of tested it out with a grad class in the summer. Um, so talking about libraries, archives, cultural heritage institutions, not being neutral spaces. Um, and this, this drove uh, a lot of the conversation and, and kind of asking ethical questions. Um, and so in the email that I received from one of the students, she was saying, you know, I never thought about where do the materials from libraries and museums come from. So that was awesome. Great. And there was another question about your use of Padlet for student engagement and whether uh, you got good responses with that and what their engagement was like using Padlet. Yeah, they had really good, and I encourage you guys, uh, um, if you go to the link and the Padlet, you can see some of the questions and observations. And there's some kind of funny ones and like some really interesting questions. Um, the thing that came out of the Padlet uh, for me was because I had kind of written into the instructions at the top that they are, they were welcome to look online. It was, that was really fun because when they came back, um, 
it was less me being like, okay, so let me give you more information about what that was. A lot of them had kind of been proactive and looked into things and that was um, really wonderful to, to see. So I think that there was a, a good response. That is so great to hear. Thank you for sharing. Um, I have a fo follow-up that I guess could be thrown out to all panelists, but it specifically references Padlet. It says, with the use of online learning tools like Padlet, have there been issues with privacy or where that information is stored? So I guess I'll toss that to any panelist who would like to respond. I think that's a great question that I don't really know the answer to. I, I didn't ask students to put their names um, and sort of wanted to experiment with this um, to see what what would happen and what people would feel comfortable with. But I think that's a that's a great question. I'd love to hear if other people have have comments. Yeah, if you if you look on the the Padlet um, that I used, it's all anonymous. So there's no, there are no student names or anything, which is how, why I feel comfortable sharing it in, in this forum. If, if, however, let's say it was something that we had kind of done through something that IU had, and so they were logged into something and their user, their name would show up. I feel like I would be very hesitant in sharing it in, in this kind of a forum, but um, yeah, which is part of why I wanted to use Padlet is that there wasn't, I also hoped that, that would kind of free them up in the moment too of like you know ask anything like whatever observation and all like there is that kind of layer of anonymity great thank you um i really appreciate that intentionality thinking about anonymity for students uh, in the moment so thanks the next questions are for katie and rachel um and someone asks i wondered if you had found more people reaching out for these modules that you hadn't worked with prior to COVID? Not yet, but they've been online for about three or four weeks now. Um, so we're hoping that we will see more, um, more interest, um, although we're also at capacity in a lot of ways, so maybe we don't want as much interest. Can I ask a follow-up question on that? So what kind of outreach are you doing? Are you doing outreach right now? Is that coming later down the road? Um, how have you kind of, yeah, um, present this to, to your community? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we've shared it on some faculty lists so far. Um, most of our faculty, I think like many other people heard um, for fall felt very overwhelmed by just prepping their courses. So I think we'll see more interest in the spring. Um, our instructors are starting to do outreach for spring classes to faculty, and we're kind of prioritizing, redirecting interest to these modules rather than trying to do a lot of synchronous teaching online. Um, and then we'll be um, sharing out on some other professional lists and things. Um, we're kind of including a tagline along um, with that, like if you use this, um, please let us know um, what your experience is, just because we would like to get the feedback and know what's working, what's not working for folks. Rachel, feel free to add. I, I totally echo everything Katie said. Uh, some folks have started um, sharing some on social media as well um, on Twitter, but as Katie said, sharing with professional organizations and listservs, that's, that's what we've been doing with the history of medicine specific modules. I think that wraps up the questions that we had from the chat, unless uh, Miriam sees any others. Um, so if anyone would like you know, to vocalize any questions that they've had, I'll create a space for that. And I'll keep an eye on the chat if anyone wants to type anything else out. I have a question. This could go for anyone. Um, as you were, I guess I'm, I am, uh, well, this, this is a new one. 
as you were making these plans for either the synchronous sessions or these asynchronous modules, um, how much of this planning is done like hand in hand with teaching faculty and how much of it was library and archive staff sort of like saying, okay, this is what we're gonna do and and it's gonna it's gonna fit into your your class. So yeah, kind of where's the where's the meeting point? I can say that mine was like, my relationship with Dr. Hamilton is like, I made an activity, I'm really excited. What do you think? And then her being like, okay, cool. They'll get exposure to things and know you exist. Like her learning outcome idea is mostly like, do they know you exist and that you're not scary? And like anything else is extra. So she was really why I was like, we should try this. Um, but I'd be interested to hear if other people have more active instructors working with you. Yeah, I think for me, it, it depends, right? It's a great question or a great answer, it depends. Um, and it really does depend on the instructor and what kind of um, working relationship we, we kind of have with them. In this specific case, because Rebecca Bauman had done um, this class so many times, she had a set list of the items that she had used. Um, I don't think, I think that's all I had to kind of work with from, you know, past uh, sessions. So I was working from an item list, but then I think because it was so, such a new kind of environment, it was some, the same thing as what Colleen just said. I was like, here, I think this will work. Um, let's like, how, what do you think this this will work? Um, we can try it, you know, kind of thing. And and the professor's like, yeah, let's do it. Let's try it. Um, but, you know, I definitely have other uh, partnerships where it's um, even ones from this uh, semester and this environment where it was you know, we had multiple planning sessions over Zoom and kind of like, hey, let's look at the options for the books and let's like coordinate, um, you know, and maybe I came up with one part of the the active, uh, the activity um, that we were working on and the instructor came up with the other. So, so other ones have been a little bit more uh, combined, I guess. I, I agree with Maureen. It, it really does depend on the faculty in the course and how many students and, and so many different factors. For me, the, like I said, the faculty member was super, I knew he would be really receptive to any type of new assignment that tried to introduce materiality during this time. But I think it varies. And I think at Duke, we have people who reach out to us, Katie can speak more to that and in other areas and, and there's just this range. So it, it's really helpful to have these on hand to be ready to, to talk with faculty about. And it looks like we have some folks in the chat talking about the use of breakout rooms and whether students engaged once they weren't, you know, being supervised by an instructor necessarily and how to handle that without doing surprise checks and things of that nature. Um, I'll, I'll go. Um, so this, this class, I didn't mention this uh, before, but I did, I like, popped into every single one because it was the first I was like, I don't know if I should be doing this. I don't know if this is helpful or not. Um, and it was really interesting because sometimes I feel like I popped in and I completely broke. They were like mid conversation and I just broke that <laughs> spell or whatever. Um, but the, yeah, there were a couple that I went into and there was just like nothing kind of happening. Um, yeah, so I don't know. This is something that I have kind of gone back and forth on. I've had some sessions where I've done that and I've gone into every single room. I started doing something where I was like, if you need me, <laughs> let me know and I'll come in. But I don't know if that's super effective either. So that's something that I still, I haven't found a balance. I haven't found a good way of orchestrating that. I tried to like design my activity so people could jump around as much as they wanted. And then I had like a bonus like black book projects I think are cool section at the end. So even if they decided they didn't care about it, like hopefully they'd click something. Um, and that's kind of how I tried to approach that because I figured 
if you give someone half an hour to sit somewhere, it's probably not going to be just looking at black and white digitized versions of something for that long. All right, I'm watching, I'm watching conversation happen in the chat and I'm wondering if we want to put Pam on a bit of a spotlight here. Would you be up for talking about your conversation with faculty? Sure, it's, it, it's really pretty short. Um, so yes, I have sent it to faculty so I can, in fact, really use it to pitch for things beyond the show and tell or the one visit. Um, not everyone reads it, but those that do, at least read the the first part of it, you know, and I can I can start a conversation. And um, some of them have been glad to have it to know that there's like this expertise being thought of on this side. Um, they tend to be faculty who are naturally more um, interested in the pedagogical side of what I might do and more engaged in that way. But students too have been. Um, Usually I just put pieces of it in a, um, a handout that I have them, um, I give to them and let them kind of ask me questions about it as needed. And um, I, I, I think it just helps them sometimes. It, it seems almost like sort of a backdoor to the appeal to authority, like, like I've thought about what we're gonna do together. Um, but I recommend trying to have that conversation absolutely, even if it's um, in a cold call and you send a link out to it. Um, I find my cold calls, people aren't following the links, they're just calling me, um, they're sending an email back, but I like to have it bundled there so I can refer back to it in a nutshell. Thanks, everybody. Colleen, you have a shortened version? you want to send that out? Yeah, uh, I can send it to the list. It's not, I didn't make it, Jay Marie made it. And so it's something that floats around in my department. Um, I'll do that now. <laughs> I, I think I think a lot of people will be interested. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I can't take credit for it. It was really nice to step into a workplace culture that has like so much already developed and I'm just adding things about rare books into it. It seems like a good place for me to learn as an instructor. That is wonderful. Um, I think that we are hitting our time. If someone has kind of one last short question, feel free to jump. If not, thank you so, so, so much to our panelists. This was incredible for everyone. Um, Please join our listserv if you haven't already. It's really friendly, I promise, and super useful. If you're interested in jumping in and helping to plan further community calls, hang on. We will start a planning call just after most folks have signed up. Um, and if you have questions about it, hang out with us. We're not gonna immediately put you to work if you don't want to. So you're welcome just to hang out and see if it's something you're interested in. Thank you, everyone. This is fabulous. We can't wait to see you at the next one. I think I'm going to disappear, but thank you all for having me. <laughs> thank you so much, Carly. This is wonderful. Like, I have to start saying no to things, so I should not. Understand. Understand. Bye, guys. <laughs> Take care. You too. I have a meeting to go to, so I'll see y'all later. Good to see you. Okay. Yay. Bravo. Okay. Well done. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're, we're still. Okay, we all here? Oh, recording. Ah, yeah. I should end up here. Yes, I'm stuck.